In this lecture, we'll be taking a closer look at the general Marius, the victorious general over Jugurtha. We'll begin by looking at Marius's military and political career, and then turn to the ways in which he managed the threats from the Cimbri and the Teutoni. So Marius's political career. He joined the military in 134 BC. He came from a town outside of Rome called Arpinum. He wasn't particularly from a distinguished family, and it certainly wasn't a family that had any claim to nobility. So if Marius was going to make a career for himself, it was going to be through his own efforts. And in particular, he, it was going to be through demonstrating military prowess. He was elected a military tribune, first of all, and then elected as quaestor. And so he entered onto the cursus honorum through this election as quaestor. And then in 120, as a plebeian, he was elected as tribune of the plebs. So at this point in time is showing a certain amount of political promise in addition to his military talents. He begins to carve out an identity for himself as a popularis, so as, a, as the opposite of somebody who was an optimate, um, somebody who worked through the normal means of the senatorial aristocracy. Marius was a new man, a nois homo, the normal means of advancement through social connections, through family connections, wasn't going to work for Marius. So he was going to need to cultivate the support of the people. And that was going to be the, the means by which he would advance politically. One of the things that he does during his early political career is pass a law that prevents the wealthy from interfering in elections. So something that seems like a sort of general social good, but clearly something that was going to mark him out as somebody looking out for the masses rather than somebody protecting the rights of the senatorial aristocracy. Marius's political future looked a bit grim when he lost an election for Edile, so for the office immediately after Quaestor, and then was barely elected as a praetor in 116 BC. So the office of Edile was optional. You didn't have to be an Edile, but oftentimes it was a nice, a nice um, ring rung on the ladder um, up to consul. And so when he's barely elected praetor in 116, He's, he's the last of the, the six or so that get elected, Marius realizes that he's going to need to do something, that his chances of advancement along the curse, along, um, higher up on the cursus honorum aren't looking so good, that the chances of being elected consul probably very slim at this point. Part of the problem is simply he lacks the resources that other candidates had. He doesn't have the money. He doesn't have the influential backers that were cultivated for generations by the nobility and by the candidates that were running from these noble families. So one of the things that Marius does is he actually marries into the patrician class. Um, he marries a woman named Julia, who's going to become famous as the aunt of Julius Caesar. But what she is sort of more immediately is a patrician who has married a plebeian, and a, a plebeian who has demonstrated some virtue, um, who's demonstrated that, that he has some chance at a distinguished pol political career, and certainly at a distinguished military career. But in 116, a lot of Marius's accomplishments are still ahead of him. And so Julia being willing to marry him, or her father being willing to marry her to Marius, is an indication of this family's interest in supporting Marius. And they had something also to gain. Their the, the, Julia Claud the Julians had not been recently distinguished. They were one of these patrician families that had fallen out of favor, had fallen out of power. So what they're hoping is that through this marriage, that Marius might actually bring some, some nobility, some, some fame, money back to the Julian family. And as we'll see with Julius Caesar, this in fact works quite well. So one of the things that Marius does in order to smooth the way to the consulship um, is in fact cultivate the support of a very powerful noble family, the Metellii. 
and he has vexed relations with this family, but around the time that Rome is getting more deeply engaged in Numidia, so around 110, um, Marius makes peace with the Metelli, and he's in fact brought to Numidia as Quintus Metellus's legate. Uh, this is basically the right-hand man for Quintus Metellus, who at that time was in charge, um, was, was given the, the um, leadership in Numidia, and was in fact fairly effective um, during, during his time there. While in Numidia, Marius decides it's time to make his run for the consulship, um, and Metellus isn't too happy about this. And in fact, Salus preserves for us a, or a, a fictionalized probably, but at least um, the gist of a conversation between the two in which Metellus suggests that Marius wait. And in particular, Metellus wants Marius to wait because he wants his own son to advance. Um, and so there's a kind of rift that returns to the relationship between Metellus and Marius. Marius loses the support of Metellus, but by this time in, in 107, Marius's successes on the battlefield are significant enough to outweigh the lack of support from this, this one noble family. Um, one of the, the, pl the platforms that Marius runs on is promising that if he's elected consul and if he's then given command in Numidia, that there will be a quick end to the war against Jugurtha. This had been drawn out now for about a decade, um, and not, well, not quite a decade, but for a number of years, um, certainly since 112, when Rome had sent forces over to intervene, and the Romans were tired of it. Um, they were tired of hearing about the Numidians. They wanted it done with, and Jugurtha promised them that it would be. He also runs on the change platform, and we're all familiar with this, um, and as we, we are in a presidential cycle, we are hearing lots about change. So this is, this is a favorite um, line of politicians, and in the case of Marius, he says, you know, elect me a nose homo, um, a new guy coming from nowhere, coming, you know, without all of the, the baggage of the nobility. Um, so rather than talking about the experience of the nobility, he casts it as the baggage. He says, elect me, I'm a fresh guy, I, I'm not corrupted the way that the senatorial aristocracy is. And he wasn't entirely incorrect. I mean, there were serious problems with many members of the Senate at this point. Many noble families were known for being on the make and were known for... Um, being willing to take bribes from whoever would offer them. And what Marius does is set himself up as, as the opposite of that. And this is, this, this is appealing um, even to some members, um, more traditional members of the aristocracy who disliked these, these corrupt members, um, these guys that were giving the Senate a bad name. So in 107 then, Marius is finally elected consul. It's a combination of being in the right place at the right time, uh, the connections that Metell of Metellus and getting himself to Numidia, where he then, on the battlefield, on the war, on the battlefront, is able to establish a reputation for himself, and also being able to promise change um, to Romans who were tired of the old ways, who were frustrated. So once Marius is in, in, um, in Africa, he took command of the Roman forces. Um, and once he is elected consul, he is, in fact, given command of Numidia, but not in the sort of traditional way where the Senate awards it, but rather through a vote of the citizens. And this was very unusual, and again spoke to the rift that had developed between Metellus and Marius, um, and the fact that Marius had basically usurped Metellus's power in Numidia, um, that he had seized control, he had, was basically acting as general, was very effective in doing so, but had supplanted uh, Metellus. And Metellus was concerned about this, he was concerned about, in particular, how this would impact his, his own son. Um, and so he tries to use his power um, his, his support among the senators to 
prevent Marius from being given command in Numidia. But this doesn't work because Marius has so much popularity. Um, and so a vote of the citizens, in fact, gives him the command. Um, he does exactly as promised. He defeats Jugurtha pretty quickly. He basically arranges for, or a, a surrender is arranged, the capture is arranged. There's controversy over who exactly did it. Was it Marius or was it one of his legates, Sola, um, or Quister actually, Sola? And we'll talk more about Sola in some subsequent lectures. But at the end of the day, Jugurtha is defeated and Marius is awarded a triumph and in fact parades Jugurtha through Rome. And on the left-hand side of your slide here, you have a bust of uh, Marius. You can see he's, he's the stern military man with his battle scars on his face. And here we have a, a representation of Marius among the, the ruins of Carthage. So Carthage, after the Third Punic War, it had never been rebuilt. It was just sitting in ruins. And so Marius, when he goes over to North Africa, spent some time in Carthage, we're told, kind of thinking about um, what had happened there and remembering the glorious deeds of the Scipio family. This inspires him uh, to perform glorious military deeds himself. And so here, famously among the ruins of Carthage. And very much modeled on the idea of Alexander among the ruins of Troy, um, for those of you that are familiar with that. So the other threat that was challenging the security of Rome in the, at the end of the second century BC was a threat a little bit closer to home. So on the one hand, we had the Numidians where it was really just quarreling um, and Rome deciding to intervene rather than just let this fraternal strife play out. Um, but more significant was a threat Opposed to Roman holdings on the northern side of the Alps, so um, in a territory that was was once held by the Gauls, but now contained Roman settlements in Gaul. Um, in particular, the tribes, the Cimbri and the Teutones, who were migrating for reasons we don't really know, were migrating from the very north of Germany down south and had gotten as far south as this territory called Transalpine Gaul. So on the, the other side of the Alps, that is the north side of the Alps. And in fact, these, these tribes had proven remarkably successful on the battlefield against Roman consular armies. Um, so initially the Romans had just sent armies up and consuls up to observe them, to kind of see what they were up to. Um, to try to figure out if they did pose a threat to Roman holdings and were planning to march further down into Italy. But the Cimbri and Teutones engage the, the Roman armies in battles and win. And partly what this reveals is the extent to which the consular armies were not working as, as thoroughly and as reliably as they could have. Um, oftentimes, you would have situations where you would have two consuls disagreeing on tactics. Um, and the Cimbri and the Teutones took advantage of this disarray. Um, so between the years 113 and 105, while Rome is also occupied in Numidia trying to deal with Jugurtha, there are fights happening on the Gallic front up in the north. Um, and Rome is concerned about the news that Roman forces are unable to contain these tribes, and they're concerned that the tribes are going to gain allies in Gaul and perhaps march further south and take some territory away from Rome. Um, and in particular, this territory of Transalpine Gaul, which is, is rich land. Um, nobody wants to give it up. So there's a lot of concern about what to do, and it's dragging on. And again, the Romans are becoming impatient um, and want a conclusion to this, this threat posed by the Cimbri and the Teutones. So in 104 BC, Marius is elected consul once again. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about Marius is he's in fact elected consul six times in total, but five times in a row. 
This is a, this completely ignores the rule that you're not supposed to be elected consul back to back. And it shows us that in situations where the majority of Romans felt under threat, they were willing to have somebody who was essentially a dictator. Um, they never called Marius a dictator, but by re-electing him consul year after year, he has close to dictatorial powers. He's able to be elected consul year after year because the Romans wanted a successful military man in charge. Um, he was leading consular armies, and in 104, he's elected purely to be given command of Gaul, to go up to Gaul and deal with the threat that's posed by these warring tribes coming down from the very north of Germany. One thing that helps Marius is that at the time that he's elected consul, when in fact these tribes are moving further and further south, they suddenly move north um, for reasons that aren't really known. Um, and they seem partly, it seems to be a result of the fact that they really weren't interested in taking over any kind of territory. They weren't interested in a permanent settlement. And so they move north, allowing Marius some time to get his army together, to strengthen his army, to figure out some tactics for dealing with this, this group. And one of the things that we see about Marius is that he is, in fact, an incredibly successful and talented general. Um, that he is able to parlay his successes on the battlefield into political success precisely because he is a good general. So in 102-101, a couple of years after he's elected um, consul for the second time, so in 104 for the second time, um, he is able to pretty easily defeat these tribes. So what had been a real challenge for several other Roman consuls, um, people coming from noble families who had their butts kicked on the battlefield, Marius makes it look easy. Um, he defeats these tribes when they try to move south into territory that's occupied by the Romans, that's controlled by the Romans, and in fact is celebrated now as a hero. The Romans can breathe a deep sigh of relief in these closing years of the second century, and Marius is offered two triumphs by the Senate, not just one, but two. Um, he is not greedy, he only takes one of them, but this, the signification of being offered to is just showing the extent to which the, the Senate is so grateful that they're willing to offer triumphs for each of the groups that he conquers. Even more important than Marius's victories over the Cimbri and the Teutones, as well as Jugurtha, are his military innovations. And we do have to be a little bit careful about accepting the ancient historians claims that it's Marius who makes these innovations. Um, there's some evidence that they were in place before Marius, but certainly it's Marius who adopts them, popularizes them, and it's clearly the case with Marius that after him, these military innovations are in place. So one of the, the more interesting, famous examples is the fact that now the eagle is formally adopted as the standard of the Roman legion. So when the Roman legion marches into battle, they'll hold up the eagle standard, identifying them as a Roman legion. And on the left-hand side of your slide, you have an example of this. The eagle had been used before. Um, it, there is nothing unique about the fact that Marius adopts it, but rather what's interesting is now it's the sole mar standard of the Roman legion. Prior to Marius, there had been a variety of different standards, and so now we have what becomes the recognizable symbol of the Roman army, the, the, the eagle, um, or of Stephen Colbert for that matter. Um, Marius also introduces the breakable javelin. What this was was a javelin that when you threw it, the, the tip broke off. This doesn't seem like it would be a, a good innovation, but in fact what it meant was that you would throw the javelin, you hopefully pierced your enemy and killed them, but if you didn't, if you missed, then your enemy couldn't take the javelin and throw it back at you and perhaps kill you. Um, it meant that it became unusable. So. In fact, this was a, a, an important innovation for pitched warfare, where you're fighting in relatively close um, quarters with an enemy. 
He also introduced something called Marius's mules, but what this meant was he had the, the individual soldiers carry more of their equipment, more of their pack. Um, this meant that you didn't have these huge trains of support accompanying every, every legion. Um, it made the movement of Roman troops much faster. Individual soldiers may not have liked it so much, but it meant that the troop movements were much more flexible and you could move from one place to another a lot more quickly. Um, this was again especially important when you're engaging in skirmish warfare, where it's not just move to a battle site, fight a battle, you either win or lose, but rather where you're having to fight particularly tribes. Um, and this was true in Numidia as much as it was true in Gaul. He relied on volunteers rather than draftees, and this is a controversial uh, innovation. So Marius, for various reasons, thought that it was preferable to just ask for volunteers and to promise them rewards at the end rather than to conscript soldiers, as had happened prior to Marius. So in the past, soldiers were, were just drafted into service. Um, the advantage of volunteers is you have people who really want to be there. The disadvantage is that Marius is drawing on particularly members of the Roman citizenry that were of the poorest classes, that otherwise wouldn't have even qualified for military service. And we begin to see a trend where you get really the, the strengthening of the military general relying on the loyalty of his troops and the troops seeing themselves not as soldiers representing the Roman state so much as soldiers of a particular general. And we'll talk more about the implications and consequences of this important change in just the stalking of a, of a legion, just in how you got your soldiers together. Um, this comes to have very significant changes as we get into the first century BC. Finally, Marius is often given credit for changing battle formations. Whether or not he did this is really um, up for dubs, but clearly around the time of Marius, in the closing years of the second century BC, we see a shift in the way that Rome fought its battles, and in particular in its formations. We see changes, particularly in the deployment of allied troops. Um, so allies now served entirely as the cavalry, for exa example. Um, and Rome, the Roman citizens would serve as the, the infantry. Um, so there are some important innovations here that, again, make it easier for Rome to fight this kind of new warfare that's emerging in the late second, early first century BC, in particular sort of tribal warfare, where you're not fighting a kind of formally armed enemy that looks like Rome, but rather sort of on several different fronts, a much more mobile um, enemy.